I hadn't read comics for years until I rediscovered them some years ago. While doing my military service as a 19-year-old, I read Neil Gaiman's The Books of Magic, so I knew what comics could do artistically as well as philosophically, but I had not bothered to look further into the matter because there were so many so-called real books I wanted to read. What renewed my interest was a fascination for movies that were based on comics, which began when watching the first two Spider-Man movies by Sam Raimi. It must have been something like 10 years ago. I was astonished by the psychological depth of both of these films, especially of Spider-Man 2, and it brought me to other superhero movies like Batman and X-Men, and eventually to the comics they were based on, including, of course, the work of Frank Miller. In later years, my interest has expanded to, to TV series like The Walking Dead and Daredevil, and of course I wanted to check out the comics behind them as well. And while I found some real gems in the Daredevil universe, I was quickly disappointed with The Walking Dead as a comic. Obviously, the scriptwriters added most of the psychological depth that you find in the show. Another thing that brought me back to comics was when a working colleague recommended me to read Morbus Gravis by Paolo Serpieri, which I instantly fell in love with, partly because I have always loved dystopian SF, but not the least because of the blunt sexualization of its female protagonist. Druna was a female character who was not just beautiful in the classical sense, and I confess I always had a special weakness for brunettes and black-haired women. But she was so much more tall and strong looking like an Amazon warrior, but at the same time feminine in the best sense of the word, and with her health and vigor a stark contrast to the sickness of her surroundings, which made her appearance so much more powerful. Unfortunately, after a few volumes, the series became shallow and degenerated into tastelessness. But reading and watching Druna's first adventures felt both refreshing and liberating after the whole cult of human ugliness that I was exposed to. I was working at an art museum at the time. Today, beauty is more or less banned for modern art. It is being dismissed as superficial decoration, as unpolitical and thus interest uninteresting, or, worst of all, as fascist, that is, political, but in the wrong way. Until now, comics have escaped this criticism, while judged as not being artistically and culturally significant and adult enough either to raise interest or to provoke indignation, and consequently it was able to express things that would have been unthinkable in so-called serious art, like male strength, female beauty and even love for your country. Together with pulp literature like the works of Robert E. Howard, it was, so to speak, under the radar as Jonathan Bowden put it in one of his lectures. Now this is changing, and much for the worse, in what was perhaps the last free artistic medium in the West. Comicsgate is a reaction to this, taking its name from Gamergate. According to its members, the comics companies hire people based on their sex, race and sexual orientation, rather than on their merits. Progressive politics read forced diversity, is injected into stories regardless of context, and classic characters like Iron Man, Thor, Hulk and Spider-Man are modified as, so as to pander to this leftist ideology, including changing their sex and race, thus changing their appearance and their origin stories. Things that are not judged as being progressive enough are being purged, and all criticism is condemned as being racist or sexist. Now, is this criticism valid? Industry veterans Chuck Dixon and Brett R. Smith, who hold politically conservative views, have both been blacklisted by Marvel and by DC. Of the 30 freelance writers who had their work published by Marvel in April 2017, all of them were critical of Donald Trump and none of them was an outspoken Christian. Some comic shop owners, like the female co-owner of a Variant Edition in Edmonton, Alberta in Canada, refused to store comic books created by Richard C. Meyer, one of the members of Comicsgate, who calls trans and non-binary comic writers, quote, a modern-day carnival, end quote. 
Another prominent member is former DC illustrator Ethan Van Skyver, who talks about the so-called square globalist mess, and probably rightly so. Comicscape members claim forced diversity to cause a decline in sales, which is obviously true, since comics containing, for example, gay marriages failed to sell and had to be taken off the market. And we should not forget that this is an industry that has been struggling to survive since the early 60s, even without meddling by social justice warriors. Certainly, comics are not as white and anti-feminist as leftists who don't read comics themselves may want to believe. Publications like Green Lantern addressed things like racism already in the late 70s, which was made possible only because the infamous comic code that had introduced censorship in 1954 after the publication of psychiatrist Frederick Wertham's book Seduction of the Innocent was losing its grip on the industry. And <clears throat> comics are created for a mainstream audience, mainly for boys and young men here in the West. I leave out things like manga here because I know nothing about it. Estimations rate the number of gay people in the world to something like 4%, although there is reason to suspect that this is going up somewhat as testosterone levels are falling in Western countries. Trans people amount to 0.03% or thereabout. There are absolutely no reason at all to expose very young people to sexual problems, especially so if these are as uncommon as data suggests. As concerning race, we have seen what political correctness has done to films and television shows in the last years. Blacks and Asians suddenly started to appear in stories set in the Viking era in Europe, disregarding all historical evidence and turning these depictions of a brutal and grim age into a Monty Python show. The same can be said about the last Hobbit movie by Peter Jackson, The Battle of Five Armies, where one of the men suddenly dresses up in women's clothes making a slapstick comedy out of works written in a tone that was unusually solemn, even for its time, and made Tolkien, the born Victorian, turn five times in his grave. The stylistic inconsistency would have been no less extreme if Jackson had included a pie fight between Aragorn and Theoden in the Two Towers. As for strong female characters, it all started out innovatively and innocently with Sigourney Weaver's Ellen Ripley in the first Alien movie in 1979, where a female pilot, not a soldier, saved the day. Today, the moral obligation of presenting women as strong makes all character development virtually impossible. Where Mark Hamill's Luke Skywalker had to face his fears accept his family past and learn to take responsibility in A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back, Daisy Ridley's Ray is just an aggressive war machine, as wooden as the end of the, at the end of The Force Awakens as she was at the beginning, an expert in handling all weapons, including a lightsaber, without any training whatsoever, and who in the follow-up, The Last Jedi, miraculously learns to master the Force, after just one or two instructions from an aged and bearded Luke Skywalker. Whereas Luke himself had to study for weeks and had still not finished his training when he went to confront Darth Vader. If there is enough pressure on the comic industry to portray women in the same way, there will be no more compelling stories with female characters, which will be a great loss. As the politically conservative performance artist and comic creator Martina Marcata says, we had better let the market take care of itself.